For those of you who don't know who I am, again, I'm Jake. Um, I'm the youth and worship pastor here at ICC, and I'm relatively new still. I'm coming up on five months. Uh, I want to start. Where are my fuel students at? Raise your hand if you're in fuel, if you're in youth. Okay, I got you guys. Hey, pay attention today because there's going to be a quiz on Wednesday about everything that I talk about, okay? Now, hey, as if I uh, had a full-time job that's probably 85% of the time dedicated to teenagers, wasn't hard enough. Pastor Trevor, for the next 30 minutes, has essentially asked me to do his job. So uh, thanks for that, Pastor Trevor. Now, <laughs> hey, as lead pastor for the next 30 minutes, my first order of business is going to be to permanently change the service structure from three songs in like a 30-minute message. We're going to do 10 songs from now on. About a, Yeah, amen. I'm, amen. And of course, that is going to be effective after this week. So, so. Hopefully that stands. I might get vetoed once, once he returns to his, <laughs> his job. No, but hey, in all seriousness, I want to thank you, Pastor Trevor, very much for asking me to preach today. I'm very excited about this. Um, I had, this message kind of came to me. We, we had maybe joked about, not really joked, but like, hey, one of these days we'll get you up there to preach. Nothing set in stone, nothing serious, no date on the books. And one night I was just sleepless. I couldn't, couldn't sleep. And it was one of those moments where the Lord just is speaking to my heart. And I'm like, man, God, you're just flooding me with, with all these thoughts and this awesome, what I knew to be a message when the time was right. And uh, so I just started taking notes. And what you're going to hear today is very much from that. So very excited because, uh, yeah, I just think it's, it's going to be one of those messages that hopefully challenges us, but at the same time inspires us um, to, to act. So before we get rolling uh, this morning, we've got two very special guests. Um, my parents came all the way down from Idaho to be here. So thank you guys for coming. Amen. Hey, I, I give you all full permission to amen and shout me down and do all that. So if I bomb, hopefully they're at least convinced, okay, like they seem to be feeling it. So, you know, must have been okay. Now, they are the lead pastors of Higher Ground Worship Center in Nampa, Idaho. And uh, before that, they were um, the, the pastors to me and my siblings. Those, those were their first congregation, if you will. And I would say after raising my brother and I, they can handle pretty much anything. Uh, my sister, of course, was an angel. But <laughs> no, I love my parents, and I thank God for blessing me with parents that would come all the way here and uh, be here when I speak. So thank God for parents that love me. And a wife that puts up with me, that is my beautiful wife, Mika. If you guys don't know Mika, um, your life will be made better if you do. So we are actually celebrating our uh, third anniversary this Wednesday. So this is a big week for us. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Uh, yeah, we actually met in middle school and began dating all the way back then. But parents of fuel students, don't worry. We will strongly encourage your, your students to wait till they're married before they start dating. So they can figure that one out. Okay, now we are in fact from Idaho. Okay, so Pastor Trevor seems to kind of like to start his messages with like this, you know, the dad joke vibe. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay homage that way, pay tribute to you. Okay, so what do you all think of when you hear about Idaho? Potatoes, right? Okay, awesome. If I were to ask Idahoans, hey, what do you think of when you think about Florida? I may get some crazy answers at first, but I'll probably get one about sunshine, right? So here we go. What do you get when you put an Idahoan in the sunshine state? A baked potato. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. I had to do it, Trevor. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, God is same in every city, every state, and every nation, and I believe that he's given me an awesome message uh, for you all today. So let's pray, and then we'll get rolling. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much, Lord, for this opportunity to speak to your congregation. And God, I just pray that for the next 30 or so minutes, Lord, that, that you just, um, you say what you want to say, Father. Let nothing that is from my own agenda or my own heart, let none of that take root. But God, let your word go forth and let your word take root today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Okay, if you're a note taker, the title of today's message, if you like to follow along, do all that, is It Takes All of Us. Okay, so I'm going to explain kind of what that means. Um, for now, the, the all of us part is kind of a double meaning. So we're, we're, we're saying it takes all of us as in every one of us, and it takes all of us as in the entirety of the individual. So it takes all of me, but it takes all of us as well. And um, what do I mean by the word it? And it takes all of us. I'm getting at the advancement of the kingdom of heaven. So today I'm referring to that. And I'm going to suggest to you that your salvation is not just for you. 
I believe that, yes, you're saved, and that's awesome, but, but hey, God wants more than that. I believe that there's a whole world out there he wants us to reach. So if you're saved, praise God. I'll see you up there, and, uh, you know, we can, we can play football, and I'll break your ankles. Um, but I don't know about you guys. I want some more competition up there, right? Like, I don't want to just always be dunking on my man, Corey Dickerson, wherever he's at. You know, I want some other hoopers up there, some more com- competition. So, hey, let's, uh, let's advance the kingdom of heaven. That's really the focus of today's message. Let's win some souls, okay? Amen. Let's talk about how to do that. Yeah, so if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along, we're going to start in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. That is going to be known as the Great Commission for those of you that um, have maybe not heard that passage or that, that ver- those verses before. Now, forgive me, I'm ignorant to the whole translation thing. There's many translations, and some people prefer one over the other. I don't really have a preference. Uh, the good news is the language is English, so that should really help us out. So we should be, we should be good there. Okay, so the Great Commission, Mark 16, verses 15 through 16. I'm going to read this out. It says, He said to them, and this is Jesus talking to his disciples, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, we often only hear maybe the first line from the Great Commission, or we hear Matthew's version, you know, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. How often, though, you know, I was reading this, and I'm like, wow, Mark, Mark really hits you with a hammer there on the second line, saying, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Do we, do we really consider that line when we read this? When we're thinking about the Great Commission, do we ever take the time to consider that second line, that whoever does not believe will be condemned? Do we take enough time to draw near to God about and, and just you know consider how much he loves all of humanity, that he would send his son not just for you or me or, or th- this church, but for all the world, for those that would maybe never accept him? Do we consider that? And think about how bad it must grieve the heart of the Father that one should not believe, that one should perish and be apart from God. I think that's a heavy hitter if you let yourself feel that. And I'm not by any means trying to place burden upon us today. I'm trying to get our wheels spinning, get our minds thinking outside of the box from, you know, our families or our inner circles. But there's a whole world of people out there that we can reach. Now, one, one important distinction this morning is we can't make somebody believe, of course, but we can live our lives in a way that points to Christ, and I would argue that we're, we're called to do that. So another popular passage, uh, passage of Scripture, uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. This is Jesus speaking again. It says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Those verses are so powerful, and it, it just wrecks me when you just stop and take that in. And there's some pretty profound statements in that. Think about this. The hands that shaped the world, the universe, have a gentle touch. Isn't that just crazy? The voice that booms life out of it is somehow soothing. The mightiest being of all has a humble heart. It's so powerful to just consider that, that this is God and he's got this humble, gentle, soothing, calming nature. Now, for those of you who don't already know, or sorry, for those of you who do already know about what a yoke is here, I'm just going to explain that real briefly. When Jesus says, my yoke is easy, so the yoke was a heavy wooden harness that would essentially hook up to the equipment that oxen would carry. So um, Jesus is making a stark contradiction here, offering a light and an easy yoke. This is in contrast to the weight of judgment, religion, expectations, you know, sin, heaviness, you name it. Jesus said, come to me. And he's saying there's such relief. There's such relief in Jesus, such peace and comfort. So here's the challenge with that. So you read that. We know about that. Many of us have heard that many times. Church, is your yoke easy? Is your burden light? What do I mean by that? When people interact with you, is that how they describe you? Is that how they feel? Man, you know, so-and-so is so, I I mess up at work and he's just, he or she is just so kind and patient with me and nice. And when I'm going through something, they say, hey, come to me. I'll pray for you. I'll, I'll take you in. 
I'll do whatever I got to do because I love you and I care about you. And again, if we are Christ followers, I would argue our whole aim should be to be Christ-like. So if his yoke is easy, his burden is light, shouldn't we be the same way? Amen. So the way that we live our lives matters. It's just one way that we can reach the loss. Let's talk about another way that multiplies beyond measure because to some degree you can sort of measure you know, any lives that you impact if someone comes back to you and gives you feedback. But let's talk about a way that you can't. Now, I'm going to just say it, and I'm going to apologize in advance. I mean, there are some passages of Scripture that are just heavy hitters and really exciting to read, and then there are passages of Scripture where you kind of have to dig in and then, all right, I got to get through this. And I'm just being real this morning. Uh, That happened to me when I read this for the first time. We're going to be in Exodus uh, chapter 36. But what I love about that is even in the, like, nothing in the Bible is boring, but if there were boring passages, I mean, it could be in Exodus, um, or Leviticus. <laughs> However, the Lord still has nuggets within there. So we're in Exodus 36. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Moses and the, um, the Israelites, not yet quite the Israelites, coming out of Egypt, heading toward the, the promised land. They're constructing the tabernacle. Um, so what the tabernacle was, again, it, it was um, sort of like a, a, a portable church. So they were going to pick it up. They were on their way to the tabernacle, or I'm sorry, to um, the promised land, and they, you know, would have to move and, and do all that. So they're constructing the tabernacle. Exodus 36, verses 2 through 7. Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Aholiab and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work. They received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. So all the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they had all, what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. That, that's just an amazing picture of a church. This is essentially the first church that we really have, I guess, record of if you consider the Israelites just constructing a church, a meeting place for the Lord. And how beautiful is that, that they brought more than what was required, more than enough. They literally had to say, stop, we have it, we're good, we're covered, stop bringing all of your your offerings here. There are three keys, I believe, that we can take away from this passage of scripture about sowing. And here we go. So number one, they trusted that their leader heard from God. These people would not be bringing stuff if, you know, Moses commanded, do this. If you didn't know Moses heard from God, you'd be like, so? Moses told me to do something. You know, I mean, if he's your boss, sure, but they trusted that their leader heard from God. Most of you attend here because in some form or fashion, you believe that Pastor Trevor or whoever is speaking that week is going to have a word from God that's going to minister to you. You're going to be fed here. You're going to come and receive and, and worship the Lord. You, you trust the direction of the church. You trust in some form or fashion that your leaders hear from God. Number two, they trusted that they were God's people and he was with them. Again, it wasn't enough for them to simply believe in Moses. Like if if they just kind of believed in Moses and didn't think there was something higher here, some some higher being, some some higher power, they probably would have just brought enough, not more than enough. They likely would have just been like, okay, that's it. You know, I brought what I had to bring. That's what was required of me. And that's that's it. But they knew God, and they knew that he was good, and it was a form of worship to sacrifice unto the Lord to bring your offering. So church, trust that you are children of God. Trust that God is here. He is with you. He's for you. He's all around you. And when you sow into the kingdom, sow with that in mind. Number three, they trusted that nothing to give, or I'm sorry, nothing given to God is wasted. If they didn't believe that God could use their sacrifice, their gifts, their seeds, their time, whatever they were bringing, they would have held on to them because it would have been better in their hands than in God's. But they had to have had the knowledge that God could use their offering. I'm going to tell a little personal story here about how nothing is a waste and how I've seen that reflected in my life. I, I went to college. I got my degree in exercise science. Um, before that, let me just say, I, I have lived 
and this is by no means me bragging at all, but I've lived my life kind of in surrender um, to God. Since the age of four, I, I said the sinner's prayer, accepted Christ, and then as I got older, I, of course, learned more about what that meant, let that take root, and I would say 14 was about when I was really like, okay, yeah, no, I, I am all in on this, on this, this whole living my life with Christ and for Christ. So I would say that anything that I did, I tried my best to give it to God. Now, I went to college, got my degree in exercise science, used that for about a year because not a lot of money in exercise science unless you, you know, want to go really, really far. So I start to kind of brainstorm like, man, this, this is rough. The effort that I'm putting in doesn't necessarily line up with the paychecks I'm collecting. And I saw the writing on the wall. and I'm like, beyond all that, I just don't really like this. So um, my dad was a career long salesman. He kind of got my wheels spinning thinking about sales. Um, I win all the arguments in the family. So it's like, all right, I mean, if I can out my dad, then I should be pretty good. They might disagree, but we can argue about that later over lunch. Um, so it was my dad that got me thinking about sales. It was my mom that got me my first ever sales interview at a job that uh, a company she was working for. It was that job that strengthened my resume and allowed me to get a better sales job. Now we get a negative. It was that job getting destroyed by COVID that made me pivot. And then I had to look for something else. Uh, my little brother was selling cars at the time, gave him a call. He got me an interview. I got the job selling cars. I was selling cars with my brother. And it was that time with my brother that allowed me to just, uh, both of us, to get closer than we've ever been in our adult life. And my brother was raised in the same home as me. Um, you know, he, he was kind of like one foot in, one foot out. He would tell you from his mouth, um, his own mouth, about, about church and about God. And so that time with my brother, I got to nag him as the older brother and say, hey, dude, come to church. Come on, man. There's something, something to this. I promise. Like, come to church. Come to church. Come to church. He finally decides to go to church. He gets baptized, and he's on fire for God. It was that time. So then me and my brother in this, in this dealership, we just start talking to everybody about Jesus. We were probably really annoying to that dealership. Actually, I know we were very annoying to that dealership. But my point with that, me and my brother, we had this thing, this flame going, and it started to spread throughout the dealership. People start talking about God. They start praying more. We had two friends draw really close to God again, come to church. Both of them get baptized and to this day are serving the Lord and are in church with their families probably right now. So my point with that is, is ups and downs. That's just life. But when you live in surrender, when you offer things to God, you let go of it. You say, God, I may want this, but I'm going to give it to you because nothing uh, given to the Lord is wasted, church. Nothing. So that's one thing I wanted to tell you today. God's kingdom is not complete after just one person makes a decision or just decides to accept Jesus for a day. It's a, it's a process. It takes all hands. We see that modeled here in Exodus. Now, by no means is this a give us m more money uh, message. Not at all. Many of you guys donate a lot of money and resources to this church, and that's amazing. I speak for myself and, and the remodeled home that we live in. Thanks to you guys. Um, we're very, very grateful for all that. I know Pastor Trevor is extremely grateful for a gracious church that sows uh, their money, but we're, we're, in order to get where we're wanting to go, the vision of this church, to grow and really reach this community in the capacity that, that we desire, we need something a little bit more than money from time to time, and that's your time, your effort. Thank you, whoever said it. That's time, effort. We need people willing to help with kids. I know Nikki's up to her neck back there with kids, likely right now. We need people, you know, just anything, anything and everything. Bring your talents, bring your gifts. If you have a desire to serve, um, I'm sure we'll have uh, more information on how you can do that later, but we, we need your time. We need your, your effort. And that's how we build the kingdom of God. Okay, I'm going to go to another verse, Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. I first read this verse um, one time, and, and I don't mean to use all the spiritual cliches about, well, God came to me this way. He talked to me at nighttime. He did this. But, but these are real experiences that I've had. So one night I was just, uh, you know, I was just exhausted, just like, Lord, in life, not necessarily tired, but Lord, where am I going? What am I doing? I need an answer. I need to hear from you. I need direction. I need this and that. And I just start to pray. And at the time, I, I was running a, a young adult, leading a young adult's Bible study with my wife and, uh, you know, serving um, as a volunteer on the worship team, but every week, um, working full time, just doing a lot, helping out at youth group, all, all, all of this stuff. 
And, but, but I felt like I didn't really have this direction for my life. And so I just start to pray. I'm like, God, I need a word from heaven. I need to hear you. God, will you speak to me? I want to hear your tangible, audible voice. God, please speak to me. I need, I need something. And how many know that God often answers you in ways that you don't necessarily, he's God. <laughs> he's not limited to, I don't have to speak my voice to you. I'm God. I speak through however I want to speak through. But I'm like, but God, like, you know, so I'm sitting there, God, speak to me, speak to me. And all of a sudden, my mind just starts echoing with, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. And I'm like, okay, fine. You know, I'm pouting. I'm like, fine. Okay, I'm going to read. Like, what am I going to read? A whole passage? I just got prompted to sort of open up to where my bookmark last was. The last book I was reading was Daniel. And I, I read tra- chapter 12 and three verses in. This is it. So this is Daniel, and he's having a vision. And uh, an angel or the angel of the Lord, however you interpret that, is speaking to him. And it says, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And just that line alone spoke so clearly to me. It was this, hey, you are, you're advancing my kingdom. You're, you're doing all these things. You're volunteering. You may feel overwhelmed. But it's, it's so crazy how God can speak a whole book to you through one verse of scripture. And man, I I heard everything I needed to hear from him when I read that, because I I was strengthened. I was equipped. I was on fire again. Okay, Lord, I know you're with me. I got this. Like, I I trust you. And then other scripture starts flooding to your mind, like steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. So he's got me. He's got me. That's, that's my whole point. So hopefully this scripture, it just kind of depicts you guys. And hopefully by now you're like, okay, I get it. We got to advance the kingdom. Let's get on with it. Um, How do we do that? Okay, so here's the thing. We often feel charged up on a Sunday. We hear an awesome message. We get convicted or, or we get, you know, inspired and we're like, okay, we're going to go about the rest of our week. You know, I feel fired up, but then Monday comes, Tuesday comes, real life happens. How do we keep the momentum going here? How do we stay motivated to advance his kingdom? We all know, I would say probably presently, hey, yeah, like we got to advance the kingdom of heaven. How do we stay motivated? I've got three points from you. I got the typical preacher, you know, three points deal. Number one, daily keep your fire stoked. This comes to us from Leviticus uh, chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. So God is giving the Israelites instructions on how to, how to worship him, how to live, how to handle, how to, how to handle the temple and sacrifices, et cetera, et cetera. These were regulations from the, uh, for the priests holding this, or handling the sacrifices on the altar. So it says, verse 12, the fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. Every morning, the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat of the fellowship offerings on it. The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. I believe this is a beautiful picture for how we should live our lives, church. Lord, let our fire not be burned out. Lord, let our fire not be quenched. God, fan the flame every day, Lord, every single day. We need to daily seek the Lord, daily worship him, daily talk to him, daily praise him, spend time reading his word, just commune with him. Said another way, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's Psalm 37, verse 4. Here's the thing about that, that verse. I don't think we have it on the screen. Delight yourself in, in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's because your desires change to his as you start to delight yourself with the Lord. And thank God that they do, because we got some crazy desires as humans, I'll just say. So here's a sub point, guys, that I, I kind of wanted to expand upon. I think I'm, I'm part, maybe I'm just here today to tell you that you all carry the spirit of the living God with you, inside you. So everywhere that you go, he's there. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He goes before you. He is behind you. He's all around you. He orders your steps, like the, the verse I just referenced a second ago. If you carry the Lord with you in every room that you walk into, there's no telling who might be set ablaze by your fire. It's like that, that old song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Well, it's not going to shine if you don't keep it stoked, if you don't give that fire some, some kind of fuel. And that's a plug for our student ministries, which is called fuel. Um, if you don't keep that fire stoked, if you don't give it something, if you're not daily asking the Holy Spirit, fill me, Lord, let me set my thoughts on you, you God. When you do that, you meet with the, God, the, with the Lord. You say, Lord, 
I just want to think like you think today. I want to speak like you speak today. I want to see what you see. I want to talk about you. I want to tell somebody about you. You're more likely to then talk about him when you go into the workplace. You're more likely to model the way that he is and do the things that model his behavior rather than the things of this world. I've heard this saying before, and I love it so much. You might be the only Jesus that somebody sees. That's a responsibility, church. Again, it's not meant to be burdensome, but that's a responsibility. Okay, so number two then, read and be emboldened by the word of God. The, the simplest phrase that you read, that just one verse, can change your whole day, your whole month, your whole week, year, life. The word is alive and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. There is such power in the word of God. I'll give you an example. Joshua 1 9. Now, I, I don't I wouldn't say I necessarily have a favorite scripture. I, I love all scripture. This this is up there though for sure. Joshua 1 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So be strong and courageous. If the Lord was commanding Joshua here to be strong and courageous when going into war like with swords and other things that could kill you, how much more should we be confident and courageous to go speak to somebody about Jesus? Because here's the thing. We're both advancing the kingdom of God. Joshua was, was on his way to take the promised land. We are on our way to advance the kingdom of God. He did it with swords and, and fighting and blah, 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 all, all the intense stuff. We do it with words. That, that's such, like, that, we, we took the easy way out. Jesus made it easy for us. Like, we just have to speak about it. And still, we are sometimes in our heads, we, we allow ourselves, we talk ourselves out of it. So you're telling me Joshua was more courageous about potentially getting sliced in half. It's a little PG, you know, a little bit over PG, so I'm sorry. Then we are about someone disagreeing with us. You know what the worst thing somebody could do if you go up to them and say, hey, you know, I, I heard you're going through this. Thank you for sharing that for me. I just want you to know God loves you. God's got a plan for you. I want to pray for you, and, and I just want you to know that, that God sees you. The worst thing they could do is go, yeah, I don't believe you. Okay. I mean, that would be a weird response anyway. Like, I don't know if people really, but they might. That's, not, that's, that's nothing to be afraid of is my point. Okay, this one's a heavy hitter. Some of us are more willing to argue about politics and are more proud to share our political stance than we are to use the name of Jesus. Pastor, I'm done. You can, I'm just <laughs> No, here's the thing. You'll call yourself a Republican or a Democrat quicker than you'll call yourself a Christian or a Christ follower. Now, hold on. I'm not by any means saying that there aren't real spiritual battles and real things going on with the high ups and the people that run this country that, that we got to fight for. We should be praying. We should be standing up for godly principles wherever we can and, and all of that and fight it with, with prayer because, you know, Paul said we, we wrestle not with flesh and blood. But I'm encouraging you that instead of entering a place where, where, they may, where there may be political opposition, rather than walking into that room as a Republican or a Democrat, what if you walked in that room as a Christ follower, as a Christian, as somebody who loves Jesus? Because those are two very different approaches. If you, if you walk into a room as a, as a Republican or a Democrat, knowing there's political opposition, and, and it may come up. Somebody may start talking about their views or whatever. And you go, you walk in there and you're like, okay, if they say this, I'm going to hit them with this fact or this opinion. I'm ready. I'm on the defensive. You're, you're like ready for confrontation. And you're ready to just kind of tear down their argument versus if you enter the room in every conversation with the full armor of God, walking in the authority that he has given you as a Christ follower, it's a very different approach. A, you're not going to be all insecure and, and like, okay, I got to have like these arguments saved up and all that because you brought God with you. What's there to, what, who would be insecure with the spirit of the living God? He, he makes you secure. There's, he's God. There's nothing to fear. So you, the insecurity's gone. B, you won't respond harshly or be ready for confrontation, but you will look at this person and think like Jesus. What does Jesus think? Jesus loves this person regardless of their political stance. Jesus cares where they came from. He cares how they landed on this political, you know, their ideologies. Jesus cares about everything about them. Jesus loves this person. 
And I hope I don't need to back that up with scripture. If you need examples of Jesus loving people and caring about people that were his enemies, the Bible's not lacking there, so just open it up. You'll find something. Now, in that love, when you, when you approach it that way, you approach it with love, there's a chance to bring about correction where you're correct, growth where you're not, and common ground where neither of you know, because the newsflash, neither of you guys are God. None of us are God, and we don't know everything. I'll tell you where there's no room for any of that, though, is when egos come in and an attachment to an ideology takes place of an attachment to God or a dependence on God. Church, be careful not to make an idol of your ideals. Now, again, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm not, if if you're, you know, you're real involved with politics, that's your jam. Do your thing. I'm going to watch the Niners every Sunday. That's kind of more my thing, but uh, I'm challenging us to move, to act, to advance the kingdom in the workplace, in schools, in this community, even in the church. There could be people that are lacking, like desperate in this place. Say hi to somebody, shake their hand, tell them you love them, tell them you're going to pray for them, all that stuff. Let's be that kind of church. Okay, you ready for the last point? We're, we're, we're kind of almost done. Last point, practice love. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8. This is commonly like the marriage passage, right? Like when somebody's at a wedding, you know, they, they love to, to read this. I was talking with Pastor Mike, actually, and we were talking the other day about this passage and how this passage is found in 1 Corinthians, which is obviously addressed to the church. So if it's in 1 Corinthians, which is addressed to the church, shouldn't this passage somewhat be addressed to the church? Of course, it's not just for marriages or romantic relationships. Rather, this is a look at how we should behave as members of the body of Christ in all areas. And I'm going to take that a step further. So 1 John tells us, God is love. So to take some liberties with this passage and say, if God is love and this passage is about love, let's imagine God, if you will, in all of these descriptors. And you're going to see really quickly how this lines up. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. God is so patient with us and so kind to us. It does not envy. It does not boast. God has no reason to envy, no reason to brag. He's God. He's not proud. It is not proud. God is not proud. He sent his son to be just a lowly human hung up on a cross. Like it doesn't get less proud than that. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Thank God that he is not easily angered. He's patient with us. He gives us time and time after time and time. Just keeps going. It keeps no record of wrongs. When you repent, when you turn from your sin, he casts it as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't keep record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. God is holy. There's no evil thing about him. There's not an evil thought in his mind. It always protects. Thank you for protecting us, God. Always trust. That's a big one. God trusts you. God is God. He can create billions and billions upon billions of combinations of people, and he he chose you. He created you. That means he trusts you. He's got a plan for you. God, thank you for trusting me. Lord, help me to do my best not to, to squander that trust. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. God never fails. Isn't that beautiful? This is a look at God's character, if you take it that far. As Christ followers, we should model this. We should be really good at this. Are we patient with one another? Or anybody that we meet, are we patient when somebody messes up? Or are we kind of quick to, ah, you know, get all worked up? Are we kind to each other and to our neighbors? Do we boast? Are we proud? Some more than others. I mean, I've been proud in my life, and I've bragged in my life, you know. I told you guys I'd break your ankles in heaven. That's you know, pretty braggadocious. Even the preachers are flawed. That's my point. Here's a big one. Do we rejoice with the truth or do we enable or sort of bite our tongues on challenging issues? I would argue we could be a lot better at rejoicing with the truth and speaking out truth. If we love like Jesus, it will break our hearts to imagine anyone going about their lives apart from him. Again, this is not meant to be a burdensome message for you, church. This is, I mean, think about Jesus. Jesus had to turn people away that, that wouldn't follow him, that wouldn't listen to him, that just made up their minds. They walked away. They wanted nothing to do with him. So that's going to happen from time to time. You may share something, and it may not be well received. But it's, it's not up to you to, to reap the harvest. It's up to you to plant the seeds, to do the work, to speak into somebody's life, and pray over it. 
you share the gospel with somebody, you tell somebody how much you love them or that you're praying for them, whatever, you may walk around and be like, man, that just like, it didn't seem to go the way I had envisioned it. They, they thought this or that, or it just, their, their reaction was off. That's not yours to carry. That's God's. Give it to him. Pray over it. Pray over the seeds. If you have the opportunity to show the love, the love of Christ to a stranger, to your church, to your family, imagine what could happen if you took it every time. Every time you have that opportunity. And you have like a spare second. You're not like, oh, I really got to go or whatever. But if you, in those moments when you have a chance to really show the love of Christ to somebody, imagine if you took it. Church, let's model the love of God to this broken world because they don't see a lot of it. They see a lot of craziness. And it, unfortunately, it just seems to get worse in that regard. Let's continue to model the love of God. Trevor, I'm going to ask you to come up on the guitar for me, please. Okay. So to summarize, bring God your all. So these are sort of the, the points that we've got up there. The way that you live your life matters. People are watching you. Is your yoke easy? Think about that. Is your yoke easy? Do you model that? So, because nothing you bring to God is a waste, whether it's your time, your money, your effort, any of it. Anything given to God is not a waste. Stay motivated to advance the kingdom of heaven and live out the Great Commission. And we do that by three, three, three keys here. Number one, daily keep your fire stoked. Number two, read and be emboldened by the word of God. And number three, model God's love. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. And if you're in this place and um, something about this message today convicted you, maybe you have not walked with the Lord before ever in your life. Maybe you've not accepted Christ as your Savior and you want that. There seems to be a joy to that. I'll tell you, it's really, really simple. You just got to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus died for your sins and rose again. And that's between you and God. Today, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come up here. I'm just going to give you a few seconds of silence, a few moments, and just ask that you say that to God, that you pray to the Lord and say, God, I, I want to accept you, Jesus. I need you. I've been walking this road on my own. I've been going through this life on my own, and I need you, Lord. Go ahead and talk to him this morning. Okay, and maybe you're in this place and you know Christ. You've walked with Christ. You've lived your life for Christ. You've dedicated your life to Christ, whether it be a week or 50 plus years. But there's something, you're, you're wanting that fire to be set ablaze again. You want to carry the name of Jesus like a banner into every room that you walk into. If that's you, I just want you to, to think about that. I'm going to pray for, for, for that for all of us. And I just want us to come into agreement for that. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you, God. God, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross and rise again for us, Lord, to pay the price for our sins. Lord, forgive us for not advancing your kingdom the way that, that we should. Father, that should take such root in our lives, God. God, that should just be our, our main concern in life telling somebody about you and your goodness. Father God, I pray that today, Lord, you set hearts ablaze in this place. Let the fire of the Lord just pour out from within us. Fill us up, Holy Spirit. Fill us up that when we go about our weeks, the rest of our week in the workplace, in schools, in the community, Father God, that you just set us ablaze, Lord, that, that we may be able to spark somebody else's fire and tell them about you, oh God. Lord, thank you so much for, for this week, Father, this, this day. God, I pray that this message ministers to somebody, Father, and that they, it takes root in their heart, God. Lord, I pray that every step we take, we remember that, that we, are, we are yours, Father. We are your hands and feet on this earth, God. And we make room for you to move in us and through us and all around us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.